Him and he and Dad were kind of close. Huh? And there was a there was a, where I tied up in '49 and '50. There was a boat right next to me, and it was a Farley. But that's four, six years later. I just, in other words, Daddy was a mainlander, and I'll say this for the record. Most of the time, he rode the bus over, and then walked over. Of course, the ferry landed right there at Henry Studeman's or Ed Turner's, which there, and he just walked to the boat or walked around the Coast Guard station. And uh, in the afternoon, he took off his zinc oxide and his long sleeve shirts and put on mm -hmm. his quote dress khakis and an mm -hmm. open shirt and uh, walked across, went home. So he didn't socialize, you know, with that. And many of his customers, even coming over here, liked to stay in Randall's Pass because they had been customers so long. They stayed in the old Mentor Hotel, which is, of course, now gone. And I guess it's still called the Stanza Hotel. Okay. Then there was the Alamo Courts, which were right there across from the schoolhouse is right there a couple of blocks down and there were some ports right out on the end of town and you know once you get staying in the same place and maybe you bring your family down and the family stays there they get acquainted and they know how to walk down to the waterfront and so many of his customers stayed over there and uh, they probably had I, I had that my, I had that question in thinking about speaking with you today if if what you're saying, the, the, the fellows came, let's say, from San Antonio to Aransas Pass, and they've been doing that a long time, fishing with your dad. Why wasn't your dad keeping Lucille at a Con Brown Wharf, putting his, his party aboard her there, steaming down the channel, Aransas well, Channel, and out? That. Once he had the Lucille, she knocked over here. During the 100 days spent. Right. He operated totally out of Port Aransas. And was that, he did that rather than Aransas Pass? For oh, what yeah, reason? he did. For what reason? For what reason? Because of the run cross and because many of the customers were beginning to stay at Port Aransas. Okay. Back in those early days, just remember, there wasn't many places to stay in Port Aransas. Okay. <laughs> okay. So one reason that he used the docks in Port Aransas was to save fuel from the Aransas Channel Run. Both that, time, you know? convenience. Okay. And the the clients, they would take a car across the, across the ferry, or their parties, would, mm -hmm. and they would stay here. Or if they stayed in Aransas Pass, they would just drive over for the fishing day. Yeah. And then drive back. Yeah. Okay. Okay. You mentioned the bus. Was there a bus that ran just back and forth from Aransas to, yes. to, to the uh, ferry landing and turned around? Yes. Wasn't Far back as I can remember, the bus parked right there at the gap in the seawall. You had a little booth where you paid your dollar or paid your nickel to get on the bus, paid the dollar for the, or maybe 50 cents in the early days for your car. And that's where the bus stopped. And if I recall, on the hour and on the half hour, I mean, it was making a round trip every hour from early morning, to, and depending on the season, till late in the afternoon, maybe during off season, it may be as the people are waiting. <laughs> and then over on this side, seemed to me it was kind of a little, little drop down to where the ferry landing was. And that's where you had a little box where somebody stood to take your money. So that's where you boarded the bus. and. The, Kids going to high school, they boarded the bus, and and maybe the bus at that time would carry them to school, you know, for that run, and maybe pick them up in the afternoon. But it was just a commercial operation to transport people back and forth from the island to Aranjas Pass. Mm. And uh, as a kid, I mentioned in the a remembrance to a father, that's what that's about. I'd run down there and have my nickel or dime or whatever it cost me to come across, ride the ferry across, and I'd head off to the jetties and waiting on Dad and see his boat come in. I'd run back to the 
fish house wherever he was working and uh, out of it. Hey, Dad caught three fish or you know, something like that. And long before, you know, he got in and uh, generally, of course, sail fishing, he was the last to come in, even though he left the early in the morning uh, because of, you know, the time to run to go offshore. And he didn't have the fastest boat. I mean, it was probably seven or eight knots was, and he never would run at full speed. <laughs> and uh, so it was just the means of everybody I mean, we didn't have cars. We couldn't ride our bicycle. So back in those early days, all you had was two by twelves <laughs> and the railroad track in the middle. <laughs> and there wasn't much room, you know, for that. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I did swim twice from Grand Daddy's Fish House to the uh, tow boats there at the corner in the channel. Mm -hmm. you're, you're... Of course, I was never more than. 20 or 30 feet from shallow water. Mm -hmm. But what an outgoing tide, I hope. Well, I don't think we ever gave consideration. <laughs> <laughs> and then one trip I did uh, mm. take a break, rest in the guys on the towboat, gave us something to eat and drink, and so then we uh, jumped off and swam into the uh, harbor. <laughs> <laughs> Back to the August 39. So Little side story. <laughs> some folks have watched your, your dad come in it with the sportsman, uh, the sports uh, journalist, and things are, are couldn't be better. Six flags flying. I mean, we're talking about for today, and I'm sure that uh, a bubble Molina, those those fellows became very interested in what what are you all doing out there? What are you doing out there? Oh, heaven, yes. Did your dad start teaching himself? Did he start teaching the skills that he was learning in Mexico to the folks here? You know, I'm going to say to those natives over here no more than here's what I do and here's what I do. Now I will say even up through 49 and prior to that if if dad did not have a customer or they didn't show up and Mary O'Connor was a daily seven days a week she'd drive from Victoria and uh, she got here a little late, and Dad would be sitting there, and she and she would pay Dad twenty five dollars. Even though she had her own boat. Yeah, just to go with her. Oh, she he would go out with her on her boat. She would pay him the same fee he would get to take somebody out fishing or sail fishing, and she had most of the time she had two people on the boat. No words. A captain in a decade. And I will say her siesta was probably like a, a 35, maybe, I don't think it was 40 feet long, but it had a nice bow on it and, you know, a nice cabin. The deck, the fishing deck, was no bigger than what Dad had on the back of the Lucille, or a little bit wider. But uh, her name is Mary O'Connor. Yeah, Mary Bremer O'Connor. And, and that's both, Port O'Connor, that's that family. Right, and both O'Connor and Bremer, if you look under, look over to Google, they're spelled different. Right, and her boat name was Siesta? Siesta. Siesta. And she was from Victoria. Victoria, and her husband, and the, of course they are the, the bankers on the banks of Victoria. And ranchers, as I recall, the O'Connor family? Were... The O'Connor family and Dan Bremer. Dan Bremer was a big landowner. And for Jim O'Connor, was a big landowner. Okay. And Mary and uh, Dan, Dan Bremer, Mary O'Connor, Mary, bringing that group of people together, which created a land ownership, which goes into another total subject matter that I'll just read it to you. If you're interested, we'll cover it later. We can cover that later. Uh, sidebar to my colleague. The house that you commented on was very, very large across from my house. That's an O'Connor. He is of that family. Um, we've got the Siesta early offshore boat. I've got the Harpoon early offshore boat. I've got the Lucille early offshore boat. It, was there a third, was there a fourth boat that I missed? I don't remember the name of it. It was some people from Fort Worth, Fort Worth okay. that were friends of the Adairs. And that's oil. The Adair Oil? Is that the oil people? The Adair? 
There is an eight or oil. I've been there. All I know, it was a nice couple. There, he is in the picture of us in Port Isabel. Okay. And he was a many year customer of Dad. Right. There is a picture of someone, and I forget his name, 1948, sitting in the cockpit of a what looks like a sports fisherman, and we should. And it has the name of the boat on it and his name. Hall, H-A-L-L, -L, is his last name, and I forget the name of the boat. But uh, it's interesting that now that you're saying, uh, you know, that's the era that all this is happening after the war. And, you know, I mean, I came over here, uh, see, I left, of course, I was home in the summertime, but until I ran that boat, that two summers, but the summers before that, you know, I was running around the waterfront there in the ranches making money. You know, you know, making a penny or a dime or a quarter. I always found something to do, even if no more than catching a few fish, making a dollar. But I would, you know, come over to Quarter Ranges, ride the bus. But there was no lingering over here. I, a couple of occasions I do remember, was it Logan? They came from Chicago and built the uh, nightclub kind of right down in the center of the old part of town, and it burned. Oh, the silver dollar. The silver dollar. And when it burned, Lord, what year was that? I made it over here before the coals had cooled down. 48, something like that? Would that be? Yeah, I'm going to say because I'm trying to put something else together there. But anyhow, we kids, 15, 16 year olds, 14 year olds were fighting over the bar <laughs> where all the silver dollars were mounted in that the bar had burned and the glass, I guess, on top of it had busted and we were scrounging for the silver dollars. <laughs> I mean, there were silver dollars all over the place. There, there are certain myths about that fire. Did you hear any myths about why that fire started? I think a little bit. Let's see. Old school, 48. The summer of 48, and the summer of 47, 47, I was 15 years old, and Mr. Scribner said I was big enough to run work on the ferry boat. So those two summers I worked the ferry boat. And one of the jobs we were taught, if some, at that time, the ferry was coming in over on Clash Point. And we were taught if any car looked suspicious as being a uh, law enforcement agency or something, we were to run up and tell the captain. And he had his little toot 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 signal. So no radios, but oh no radio. Okay. And in whichever name it was, Studemans and Terrence, it was the same building over the years. But they had an area. It was a dining hall. But they had a pool table that dropped from the ceiling. <laughs> that was used as a dice table. <laughs> That's great. And so. Uh, Sometimes it was up in the ceiling, and sometimes it was down on the floor. And then when the what you call it, the silver dollar showed up, of course we youngsters couldn't go in because it was a legitimate open bar, I guess. But uh, I'm sure the same thing happened. And uh, you know, it was kind of like we've heard of the mafia all of our life, you know. And he was one of the Chicago. Well, of course, uh, what was his name? The mafia guy. From Chicago had his boat over Corpus for years. Joe, Joe uh, not, you not just said, Bonanno, uh, no. No, he Hoffa, was in, Hoffa. Hoffa? Yeah. In fact, it was, Jimmy uh, Hoffa? You know, it was over there for years. Even when I, I didn't was, know. In Monroe. It was used as a dining boat. I didn't know. Yeah, it, it was a long, tied up at one of the piers. But go ahead, about the so Okay, long. so you know, there was, he was of that group of family, and that the uh, feds were getting a tie on his tail. The feds. The feds were. Yeah. And so it's better to burn it down, just like it's better 
when you can't pay your bill on your boat, it's better to miss the jetty and run it on the beach and get the insurance money. So, you know, it's kind of the same thing. I mean, yeah, that was the story, you know. Um, you're, the, the, that was in a section of Port Aransas that is called the Flats, if yeah. you might call yeah. it. Oh, yeah. And the, the history that Mark and I have read about the Flats after World War II was some folks call it the honky-tonk period in town. Yeah, it was. Could you tell us a little bit about that, a little bit more? You know, I was not part of that afterlife. I mean, I came over to where Dad was, <laughs> and uh, I'd go home in the afternoon. You think there are folks, uh, what kind of behaviors were going on in those clubs? Other, uh, you, Obviously, there was some gambling. Oh, no question about that. Okay. Even in Rancher's Pass. <laughs> okay. Do you think there was prostitution? Okay. So the tooting of the horn was to clear the decks. If All I know is that Mr. Scrivener taught us to <laughs> tell the captain run upstairs to the captain. And I tell you, Roy Lee Freeze lives in Ranch Pass. He came down the year he graduated from high school, that would have been, no he didn't, he waited till late. He came down in 40, well 40, 47 and 48. He and his brother, his mother had died, and his daddy had three brothers living in Rogers Pass. They came down, and Roy Lee had just finished high school, so I had just finished my sophomore year. And Roy Lee asked me, could I help him get a job? And I said, yes, I'll take you to introduce Mr. Scrivener. And within three months, Roy Lee was a captain. <laughs> and as I told people traveling the country, management skills, work habits, here's a man that probably drove as many miles across the water as anybody in America but it was half a mile, boom, 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 boom. And I guess he finally, I, 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 saw, I saw him last trip I was here, but he retired probably at 65. So from the time he was 18 years old, and he was one of the skippers. I mean, he was, as he told me the other night when I saw him, he said, Mr. Scripter had me upstairs within six months. Now, so... When you go back into things that different people have written, Mr. Scrivener's name keeps coming up. He was part of the railroad originally. The one, I guess he was called the operator. There was a big yellow building right at the railroad track. See the, whatever the railroad was called across the Rangers Ranges road. Harbor Terminal Railroad. You see, it ended when it made connections with the railroad. San Antonio and, and, and the so Just inside of that was this big wooden yellow, brown trim building, and that was Mr. Scrivener's office. And so I'm sure he was the railroad master, <laughs> he was the collector of the money for the bus, the 50 cents or a dollar for your car going, maybe cargo, shipping, I mean, you know. They, so, but they also ran the ferries. Oh, and, yeah, they were on he, the ferries. He owned the ferries, yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. So in other words, he was it. As far because as Elda Roberts in her book writes about needing money to build a house there on School Street where Florida and she lived after they moved off of Robert, what's now Roberts Point. And she went to Mr. Scrivener to get a loan. So yeah. I, I guess he well, was the boss. He was, he was this, I mean, you know, he was just part of this community. I don't remember which church he went to. But, he, uh, he donated all the land for the Presbyterian church. Okay. But he, he didn't say it had to be Presbyterian. He yeah. wanted a church. And then uh, you had a... Then Lord Richardson comes along in the late 40s and started the LD, LWR company, which had the captive of towboat work and when it began to work in the bays and... Uh, I have a story that I wrote on the mean old man that took our swimming holes away from us, and it was Lord Richardson. 
and his adopted son took it over, and I think he died here the last few years. I know where his home place was, but uh, he was he was the money man around town, and then. Uh, I believe it was Lloyd. That's another story. Let, let me. Let, let me there so, was, you know, three or four businessmen in town who, mm -hmm. you know, they weren't of the elitist because it was such a small town. Just everybody was everybody. But Mr. Scribner was. El Angel. In other words, mm -hmm. as I said, I've heard this story before from other people, but he probably catered to the people in Port Aransas more than he did the people in Aransas because he made his money <laughs> off of the, mm -hmm. the ferries, the bridge, the bus, mm -hmm. the freight that was hauled on them. Mm -hmm. And I can remember, you know, cotton, train loads of cotton still going out. Mm -hmm. And I have a picture that I did not bring of the Galveston. The dredge. In, um, let me circle back to a little bit of fishing. Okay. And in the remembrance of your dad, in the beginning of the 44 season, you were 12 years old, and you're talking about the fact that of how just what you said, you, you came over on the ferry, you would go out on the jetty to see his boat coming back in. Before the offshore game started in August of 1939, Tremendous amount of our fishing was in the Aransas Pass around the jetties for tarpon. This is that was it. Would you say that what you were seeing there in '44, if you'll just take that one year since you've written about that, was there a lot of tarpon fishing still going on then? Was tarpon fishing? It, it, we, we want to sort of get a sense of when yeah, had it peaked at one point. When did it start coming down? Okay. And, you know. Dad was, in other words, after he got to Lucille, he was not a tarpon fisherman. He was that. sail fishing. I hear that. Yeah. And yeah, there was still tarpon being caught because some of the pictures, in other words, there's one picture in there with three sailfish and two tarpon. Yes. Now that was a day's catch of dad's. So the people went out, caught two tarpon. For 25 bucks. Yeah, and then went sail fishing up for 25 bucks, that's right. And somehow or another they twisted his arm to bring the sailfish in because he was very, very adamant that fit sailfish went back into the water. Well, they're going to mount them. They said that. Right, unless you had him mounted. See, as a youngster, he would not let me bring my first sailfish in even to take a picture. But we have that one picture mm -hmm. taken off the side of the boat. Mm -hmm. So that's how adamant he was about catch and release. And I remember... Oh, back to tarpon fishing. Now, okay. uh, does, he, he, uh, here's where I, I'm, I'm sort of heading. It began to peter out, if you want to say. I'm going to say in that early mid to mid 40s. And this, it, this would be, let's just nail a date for a minute, uh, sake of argument, 1946, 47. Just, this would be before the tarpon had left the area. In other words, what yeah. you're suggesting is the tarpon fishing had sort of peaked before they left. Because we know in the 50s is when we were told the tarpon took off. Well, let me put it this way. The two summers I ran Mr. Marston's boat, and that would have been 49 and 50, I do not remember a tarpon ever hanging on. Of course, the harbor was small enough you could see practically all of it. I don't recall ever seeing a tarpon. Were the tarpon still in the water here? If they had been, there would be some people catching. Now, I do yeah. recall when I was going to A&I in uh, 50, got married 56, 55, 56, catching tarpon as you come out of the ship channel headed back into Shamrock Island. We were fishing for trout with live bait. Marker 13. And caught a small tarpon like that. Mm -hmm. Didn't land it, but uh, 
mm -hmm. stripped the line off. <laughs> you know, that was it. L let me let me reframe my question. We could say that tarpon fishing fell off in Port Aransas because of a the tarpon went away, and that would be a clear explanation. We could say the tarpon fishing in Port Aransas came off because people changed their interest in fishing. Where, where between those two, you did they, you, is it one argument or the other, or is it in the middle? Is it a, or is it that they were overfished? That's what they had always said about the sailfish. Okay. Then you begin to have your foreign longliners start to come in way offshore. Okay. And I mean, they were taking those billfish and hauling them out of the Gulf like everything. When the tarpon fishing started to be reduced in in number, mm -hmm. did 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 the offshore fishing pick up that slack, or did the bay fishing pick up the slack? I think, in other I think words, the offshore fishing began to pick up that slack. Picked up that slack. Because see, it took just a, as you have many pictures of, just an open cockpit, eighteen. Well, look at the boat that the president was in. How long is it? Eighteen foot long, twenty foot long, open cockpit. Those were the boats, the charter boats. So they weren't capable of going offshore. So these guys had to do one or two things, go buy more money to build a bigger boat or go out of business. Or go bay fishing. Or go bay fishing. Yeah. And you know, I don't think the bay fishing out of Port Aransas from a charter standpoint was ever very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. Of course what my understanding is the bay fishing tremendously picked up with the outboard motor. Oh, definitely, no question. And so about when it. after the war, the boys started bringing their own rigs down here. Yeah. Then the bay fishing just just lost. See, it. because Dad knew the bays so much. As soon as the Gulf fishing was over with, of course he was starting to get things ready for duck hunting. But somebody wants to go bay fishing. I mean, he knew where to go in the Lucille. He could go, you know, anywhere he wanted mm -hmm. to. Corpus Bay, old old mm -hmm. terminal. And I recall one time we were down with somebody who was on the boat with him, and Dad said, "Let's go through the pass and go out in the Gulf because it was just one of those dead calm days." And we went out into the Gulf in the Lucille, fished up and down the beach, and came back. Mm -hmm. And you could catch jerky jackfish and one called schnook. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could catch them just right on the beach. Mm -hmm. And uh, we didn't stay out over an hour and a half, two hours, but we did go through. And the Lucille, in other words, when we stopped down in Port, out of Port Isabel that night catching all the flounder, when we stepped off the boat, we were on the water that deep. So, you know, he couldn't run in it very much, but I mean, he, that was his uh, floating dead weight. When he used the Lucille for duck hunting, did, was, he, was he pulling his his dory, was he pulling his boat behind the Lucille? Yes. This is how Teddy Matthews used to do it for yeah. me. Mm -hmm. And so he would do that and then he would have a boat blind, pull the boat into a blind? Uh, the technique changed. Originally he just had a, a bay brush and he would pull six and eight skiffs behind him. And the hunters would be on the boat. And he anchored the skiffs it came from the Aranges side through the drawbridge, and just past that's where he would anchor the boats, the skiffs. And then he would go out to the end of the channel and then go into the bay, and each skiff would have a hunter or two hunters and the guide, and they would go into their blind. Then he got a little more sophisticated after two or three years, and he began to build platforms. And those locations, I can point them to you, they're still out there. And then from the deep water, the little reef, and then into the flats, like that. And he would put the hunters, I mean he would, they would step out of the boat into the flat boat and depend on the number of people or how much, then he would be slowly moving and they'd turn the skiff loose and it would be split between two blinds. And then it would hit the reef. And if the men were young and energetic, then the two men and the guide would walk to the duck blinds. If the water was high tide, 
they would pull them to that and then one guy would bring the boat out and anchor it there. And uh, so the platform blind became a, another total technique. But, uh, Is that in South Bay? I guess that's what, yeah, South Bay. In other words, the old number five and six bridge. Right. And I said there's a lot of growth there now, and I guess the channel's along there. But one of his safety features was that if you really got caught in a norther, from the furthest blind that way, you could walk all the way to the bridge. So uh, he, he had, said, "Yeah, except you, other than crossing the Aransas Channel, you, you'd have to." Right? Have to yeah, go. you were. Yeah. The, in other words, that channel that they dug, that's there now to build the new road, Mark was not there. Right. So the bridge blind was 150 yards out. And then the widget blind was a little in, then the point blind, and then the big slew blind. So you could walk all of those. It probably wasn't over a mile and a half. You, you mentioned that people were pretty territorial about where their blinds went, and you didn't like, he didn't like anybody. Uh... Very territorial. I recall a couple of occasions where Dad uh, just literally tore their blind, that didn't have a platform, just literally tore their brush up. And I recall one time him telling got, that I have to take some extra gasoline with him, I won't burn this one down when the platform was built. And when I was going to college, I brought a boy home with me for the weekend and uh, we took, had a little outboard and so instead of using dad's boat, well he wasn't, uh, I don't remember the exact case, but anyhow, we took the outboard and went out and somebody had come in the day before and stuck a blind between his point blind and the widget blind. And so Dad said, I've got to get rid of it. And I said, well, we'll hunt to dark and we're going to hunt the widget blind. And so we'll burn it up as we come in. <laughs> and so uh, we hunted right up till almost Black su sunset. <laughs> and then we had to pick up the decoys and put them on the platform. So by the time you got that done, it was getting dark. And uh, I knew how to get across the bay and into the channel going in by Red Smiley, so I'd carry a gallon jug of gasoline and throw it on there and burn it up. Then in 52, when Dad sold the Lucille, went out of the duck hunting business, he sold those locations <laughs> for part of the bill of sale to Texas Eastern, who by then had bought the last house on the seawall. So they had, Dad had established, what would you call it, common tenancy, right? <laughs> uh, public water. <laughs> I don't know, you tell me. Water, <laughs> but he had been there since 1934. At, at easement, let's put it that way. <laughs> or squatter's rights. Or... Yeah, yeah, but only those people that were foolish enough to do it, because he said probably inlanders that didn't know the rules of the road or something like that. But those locations, are still there. I can look at them and see whether Texas Eastern, I'm sure they still maintain because they maintain the lodge there. And uh, so he sold them and his decoys and uh, his skips. Was Texas Eastern a company? Texas Eastern gas, was a gas company. Gas transmission. Now called what? Tenneco? Oh, Tenneco. Um, sure. Texas was, no, that wasn't Texaco. That was, that was something else. Might be Tenneco. Texas Eastern Oil. Texas Eastern Pipeline. Well, it was Texas Eastern Pipeline. Okay. Yeah. I thought it was Texas Eastern Gas Transmission, but I... It, you I, got it. Uh, you got it. I think that's what it was. I, I mean, the, the names have all changed, and you yeah. know, I kind of forget, but I used to run into some of the, the salespeople up in... Their line ended in New Jersey, and uh, I would go to a meeting every month in New York, and the first time I went there, I spotted some guys that had their name and had Texas Eastern written on it. And I walked up, and it was in February, and I, I'll never remember, I said, well, how was your duck hunt this year? They looked at me kind of funny, and I said, well, did you go down and fish on the, t uh, hunt on the tail? <laughs> well, that was the name of their boat, of course, their lodge <laughs> there. So I made acquaintance with them, <laughs> and, uh, kind of became a joke or something, you know. <laughs> and then I'd, I was going up there every month. Well, I, I had to be in New York for that meeting every month. That was one of my orders <laughs> from the 
top man in the company. <laughs> uh, so uh, he sold it to them, and as far as uh, they did have locations over around the old terminal and places like that, and uh, they were very interested in getting those. A fellow by the name of Dick Fox was taking care of their lodge at that time, and uh, so he and Daddy worked real close, and so that's the way. When Lucille was, when she took off at dawn and she had her little chain of duck boats behind her, pulled into the flats, took a client party out to the blind. Were those decoys set the night before? No. He put them in sacks. Well, when they were in the fish out, but when they duck hunted out of the skiff, they just stayed in the skiff. Okay. And they stayed and anchored out there, and the tender to the drawbridge kept a watch on them because he had to be away for anybody tooting their horn to go through that. And then when he built the platforms, that was one of the chores after the blinds were built and everything around the platform for the next seat that the next season just probably finished up a few days before duck season. The last chore was to take your decoys to the blind and they stayed there until the season was over. So when when you arrived early in the morning, would the guy put the decoys out? Yes. And then Keep would that up. be a morning and afternoon hunt, or how did that? If the guide was through and Daddy hadn't told him I'm going to have somebody else in the afternoon, he picked them up. Okay. If by chance there was somebody else wanting to go, they came back, they put the decoys out again. Okay. Out again. And he generally had about 70 to 80 decoys per spread. Mainly redhead? Uh, Legion? No wedge, uh, sprigs, males and females, and redheads. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you said you painted about every three years. So you, uh, you said when you were little, you used to paint the decoys about every three years. Yeah, some, there were several years we would, he had a little red 10 by 10 building that he stored them in at first, and then he would just pick that building up and move it to the backyard. And so through the summer, he'd take milk cartons and tube twelves and spread the decoys out. And we went down and you had your, you painted the white press and you came back and you know, you just kind of assembly line. And uh, if we didn't get them all painted this summer, we'd finish up the next summer. And maybe the next summer we'd do it again. And uh, the last time I painted them was the, uh, I guess I had, uh, 51 or 50, 51 because I'd gone to the service and uh, I'd come home from college and my brother had also, he was up there my last year with me and so we painted the whole bunch of decoys and then three years later he sold them to Texas Eastern. Now when you were, were they something that were you also made or is that something that was commercially bought, the decoys? Dad had decoys, I don't know how many, but I distinctly remember, let's see, I was about five years old, so that would be 37. He bought 1,000 used decoys, and they were all either hand-carved or carved with a lathe. And they, they had grooves. Yeah, they had grooves around them. And he bought them somewhere over around the Houston area from somebody and brought them in to our home. And uh, we, did, we lived on the other side of town at that time. And uh, he painted them. We were too small to involve it. Put in new screws in the bottom, chains, and he used a lemon squeezer to make the mold pour the lead in and uh, stick the mm -hmm. copper mm -hmm. wire in to make the hook and got them all ready. So that was the year that he went from about mm -hmm. one blind, two blind hunters, because that's all the decoys he had, up to four or five blinds. In other words, there was a thousand decoys plus, I don't think he kept very many of those older ones. And uh, when he sold them to Texas Eastern, I think there was 700 decoys and he kept a hundred. So he didn't lose very many decoys over there. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason I ask is that when Everway uh, Mercer Westmoreland died, the museum had first dibs on anything in her house. 
and in the garage were all these very, very old decoys that were probably cypress or cedar or something, but they didn't have the, the marks from, uh, you know, where, where they, the, it was commercially done. It looked like they were all hand carved. The redheads did not have it. It was only the sprigs and the ones that looked like a male sprig that had the long tail. Now the female sprig didn't have the long tail, of course, and they were not rodent. Neither were the redheads. I, I, you know, we just wonder, the, the Mercers were here in the 1850s. Did they, did they make them? Did they buy them? Did they paint them? You just don't, you, you, you know, just wonder about guess, that. But I would almost guess that they, you know, carved some of them. And uh, these sprigs, I've been told, were Tupelo wood. Which is reasonably lightweight, but apparently not to a very longevity because the only problems with any of those decoys was the uh, where the dial pin went into the head. In other words, it was just you know mm -hmm. pressed in. I did find some that had actually a uh, screw, a heavy screw that the head screwed in, and those were the most secure. Those that broke off, he would take a uh, bronze rod and kind of smooth off the head and the body and drill a hole through the head and have it threaded on the bottom and put a brass, I mean a, bra a screw on it and screw it into the bed of the wood and then clip it off. So those were locked in with a brass rod. What was your dad's fee for a morning of duck hunting? Do you remember? I can remember after I started the bird doggy ducks, it was six dollars per man, twelve dollars a blind, but the guide got five dollars. So break it down for me. I'm I'm a client. I'm going to pay six dollars to your dad. You pay six dollars. Each of you pays six dollars, okay. so it's twelve dollars. Okay. But the guide, maybe the guide got four dollars. Okay, so Mr. Mentor gets twelve dollars, and he pays the guy four four. Right, then he pay, yeah, so he winds up with eight dollars. Okay, okay, I got it. I see. So if you take five blinds a day, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. then maybe one or two in the afternoon. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 20, and I, 25, 30 bucks. And then everybody always, you know, if they especially had a good day, mm -hmm. and then they'd give the guy, each one probably give the guy a dollar. I mean, here I am, nine, ten years old, making four dollars and a couple of tip, dollar right. tips You're on the free. weekend. <laughs> you know what, it was, I say this, not trying to say the story that I'm really saying, but it was a special anniversary. I had already gone off, I was getting ready to go to school, but it was Christmas time the year before I went in September. My brother and I bought mother and dad a William Rogers silver plate system, you know, in a nice wooden case of silverware. And so when we were, had, we always had our all. There was only one gift for each person. I mean, we didn't have a whole bunch of stuff. And when mother and dad opened that, dad just broke down and cried. Mm -hmm. Where did you boys get the money? Now, I don't even remember what it cost, probably what, $25, mm -hmm. you know. And then he said to us, and I'll never forget, you boys have never asked me for a dollar, mm -hmm. but you've always had what you needed. I never asked. I was too busy working mm -hmm. trying to bring the money home, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. But we always had, I was seven years old and my cousin, who's the same age I am, a norther had blown in. I got one of daddy's skiffs that wasn't in use. We caught some live bait with a push net and pushed from the fish house underneath the two bridges went down to about that first house on the seawall and pulled up on the other side. I mean, people couldn't really walk to that little 
island there because there was a break at the bridge and we pulled up and used our cane Calcutta sticks and we caught two tubs full of redfish. Hmm. About like that. Rode back to the fish house and it was about at high tide it was only about this much. At low tide it was about like that. We pulled up to the dock and all these old men that were had done the same thing that day. They come out and helped us lift them out of the boat. And so we, the old man on one side and me and my cousin on the other, put it on the scales and granddad said, I don't buy guts and gills. <laughs> and so uh, mm -hmm. they threw them up on the table, got us a box to stand on, mm -hmm. went and got us a knife and showed us how to gut and gill a redfish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when it was all over with, Granddad gave each one of us five dollars. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that one of the old men told Granddad, he said, you didn't pay him enough. Mm -hmm. And I remember him giving us each one another dollar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we made six dollars. So that would be in 1939. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say about 39, 38, 39. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was rich. <laughs> oh, you were. I mean, how many separate year old kid at 39? Particularly then. At six dollars. Well, we're going to start wrapping it down for yep. this afternoon. And tomorrow, Mr. Minter, um, I would like to talk a little bit more about fishing and I'd like to talk about World War II because you were nine years old when Pearl Harbor was attacked by the Japanese. You lived in the area here. Um, Mark and I have done a lot of work on World War II in Port Aransas and Aransas Pass. We'd like to do some chatting with you about that. And uh, tomorrow, um, perhaps uh, some some of the stories that you, uh, some of the tangents that you wanted to take, maybe start taking a few little tangents in terms of some stories. Oh, okay. And, um, you want to get the turtles. The turtle? You want well, the turtle pen story? And, I can give uh, you the... We got the 100 day story today. And so we thank you. Because I... Oh, it's going. This is the uh, second interview with uh, Mr. Birdley Mentor Jr. This is May the 20 or 21st, 2010. We we're in the home of Mark Crichton and I'm Guthrie Ford. And we're going to start our morning with a slow review questions from what Mr. Minter shared with us yesterday. I'd like to start with this photo of the fish, Mr. Minter, that we talked about, that beautiful mount. And is that a skin mount or is that a plastic mount? No, sir, that is a skin mount. It's a skin mount. And the person in the photo is? Me. And that would be uh, like last year? Uh, in the last uh, two months. Okay, so this would be Junior. And you were, as I recall, securing this mount. You bringing it to your home or it was already in your home? Well, I've had it since uh, Dad died in 97. I probably carried it home in 95. Okay. okay. And it just hangs in my bedroom office. And the significance of this fish is that she was taken around a drift, um, typically for dolphins. Okay, were they dolphin fishing when? Dolphin fishing with fly lines. With fly lines. Mm -hmm. So this was taken on a uh, a fly rod, uh, probably seven pound test, six pound test, something probably pretty light. You know? And is that the significance of that? Was that one of the first sailfish taken by fly line? I have no idea. Right. But that's but everybody was so excited about it, from the marine lab to uh, I think uh, Dr. Arnold uh, got involved in it, right. and just several people because of its size being caught on hook and line, let's put it that way. And uh, because the marine lab, they put a date, a life on it because of its size oh, and said they had caught fish of that size in their nets but never occurred to one of the size being caught. Very much. Hook and line. I would like to just go through some terms that I uh, jotted down from our talk yesterday and as I do this uh, I'd like both you and Mark to be thinking about some of review terms that I have forgotten. So we can <laughs> kind of 
look at what we did yesterday. Of course, Mark and I will spend some hours with the video here later, but um, I guess you could call these the high points. Boat names are important in Port Aransas history. We will spend quite a bit of time, Mark and I have, uh, getting boat names correct. Um, recently, the, the name Wharf Cat, the name Scat Cat were important relative to a change in the uh, party boat era. And the names that I recorded yesterday of significance were the Alita. This was a craft owned by Mr. Uh, Half of San Antonio, Texas. Mm -hmm. This is the vessel that made the four trips to the Gulf of California. The Baja. Come. The Baja. Mm -hmm. And she, her final days were in Aransas Pass? Yes. Or? Okay. Well, her entire life was actually in Aransas right. Pass, right. except for the trips to Mexico. Okay. The Lucille was um, uh, laid down at the uh, Farley Boat Works, one arm Farley Boat Mr. Albert, Works. one arm Farley built it while they were in Mexico right. in the say, April, May, and 1st of June. 39. 39. And that was for your dad. This that was laid dad's down for boat. your dad. That's right. Um, I don't have any other boat names for your dad. Okay. In uh, 52, I came home for the service in May. I knew that he had acquired a new boat. I got home in the middle of the day, running a half a day late. And uh, I walked down to the boathouse where Dad was working. And he had the new boat inside the boathouse. And my first comment, where's the Lucille? I said, well, she's tied up on the outside. And I go look at her, and I said, you got me any parties booked? And he said, no, I've sold her. And I was extremely disappointed because that was what I expected to, at least for the summer season, mm -hmm. till I figure out what I was going to do. And he said, Birdly, it's getting to be work now, and I don't want you to follow the same footsteps. So he sold the Lucille to the fellow who was running the jetty boat. And uh, he kept her for, there was a major, major hurricane that really destroyed the whole harbor. Uh, what, uh, 57, 58, 59, somewhere in there. 60, 61. 61. 61. And uh, she wound up Girl. going under tied up at the dock. Well, was she, was she the jetty boat or? She was the jetty boat from 52 until that. Until her, 61. Yeah. And his mother. We're, now, but we're talking about taking people to the North Jetty. Yes. Right, right. And I don't remember the name of that boat that he used for, uh, oh Lord, a long time, running a work crew to. Uh, 52 to 61. Uh, so, uh, Shamrock Island, and the oil gas operation at Shamrock Island was private owned. Through some major mistakes that the land people with Atlanta, Atlantic, made, a fellow that was just a waterfront workman in a ranches realized when Atlantic started using the island for the building of bulk storage you know, from the wells bringing it in and they had actually drilled three or four wells on the island. He came to dad and said, do you know that I bought the island years ago for the white clam shell? Do I still own it? So dad called one of his friends, a customer up in San Antonio who was a geologist, uh, in the oil and gas field, lead lawyer, and determined that, uh, yes, Mr. Smith, <laughs> you own the island. And so with a few weeks of research, they served notice to Atlanta, Atlantic, and there was drilling another well, and to the driller, just keep drilling, boys. And uh, so Mr. Smith, <laughs> I don't remember his name, became the owner and production of that uh, Oil and gas, mostly gas. Very nice. Very nice. And Atlantic 
and built some storage tanks for the distillate. And so he made arrangements for them to continue using that. And the barges would come in and haul the distillate into to the docks. Okay. And so that continued to operate. Well, Dad operated that for probably t eight or ten years. But he continued to go to the Gulf fishing because there were people that were good customers and the geologist and the lawyer, you know, for the owners. And uh, I guess, uh, oh, I can't think of his name right now. He was a local man that had come in to more or less be the field superintendent. Mm -hmm. Then they had two hands that were helpers mm -hmm. and gaugers. And now brothers. what what year was this that they were building the bulk storage facilities and drilling the gas wells on Shamrock? I, uh, 50, it, it, they probably took over in 